What's up, y'all? Welcome to the next episode of the Passive Income Attorney Podcast. I hope you're all having a fantastic week. Thanks for joining in on the fun. If you're ready to start creating your own economy and taking back control of your life, start by going to attorneybydesign.com, whether you're an attorney or not, and download the Freedom Blueprint. All right, so I actually just got back from Hawaii. The wife and I took a spur of the moment trip to Oahu just to get away. We relaxed on the beach, sipped on some coconuts, but being the adventurous folks that we are, we also did an 11 mile hike the back way up to the haiku stairway to heaven, which was unbelievable. Um, there towards the end, I didn't know if it was gonna be worth it, but once you get that view, it's a once in a lifetime experience. All right, the point being that entrepreneurship and having multiple streams of income allowed us the freedom and flexibility to just get away on a moment's notice. This is what investing and buying back your time looks like. The ability to take back control and live life on your own terms, not someone else's clock. Speaking of Hawaii, our guest today, Lane Kawaioka, resides there. He has walked away from his high paying W2 engineering job and designed a life for himself that most of us can only dream of by creating businesses and strategically investing in real estate. Lane now controls over 4,800 units and is the owner of crowdfundaloha.com, simplepassivecashflow.com, and reialoha.com. Working as a high paid professional in corporate America and frustrated by the traditional wealth building dogma, sounds familiar, Lane was compelled to inspire and mentor other working professionals via his top 50 investing podcast at simplepassivecashflow.com. All right, let's jump in. This is the Passive Income Attorney Podcast, where you'll discover the secrets and strategies of the ultra wealthy on how they build streams of passive income to give them the freedom we all want. Attorney Seth Bradley will help you end the cycle of trading your time for money so you can make money while you sleep. Start living the good life on your own terms. Now, here's your host, Seth Bradley. All right, Lane, what's going on, brother? Welcome to the show. Hey, aloha, everybody. All right, man. Well, first off, I guess uh, tell our listeners where you're located at, because that's a, a really interesting thing to start out on. Um, I'm in Honolulu, Hawaii here, the uh, cool island, not the lame ones like Maui, Kauai, where nothing happens, but um, <laughs> kind of similar to the U.S. mainland. You know, we've got some couple highways, uh, some beaches, and um, yeah, just trying to invest from uh, somewhere I'd like to live. Yeah, keeping it simple, man. I love that. We'll jump into that a little bit later, too, about how you kind of invest in Hawaii, but Let's jump right in and, and why don't you just tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and, and you know, what's your story? How'd you, get to, how'd you get to investing in Hawaii? Yeah, so currently a general partner in 4,800 rental units. Uh, we specialize mostly in value add uh, apartments in the South, Southeast. So live where you want, like Hawaii, California, but invest where the numbers make sense, which definitely are not those places. I don't think I'll ever buy a house here in Hawaii. <laughs> Unless I have too much money that I don't know what to do with it. But um, I started, like a lot of people um, got lied to, got told to go, to go to school, study hard, be a little good little boy, and uh, eventually became an engineer. Started working as an engineer and just realized how much it's kind of a drag on your lifestyle, you know, to go to a job every day. Um, started investing back in 2009 and did a whole bunch of out-of-state rentals, started in Seattle, but then went out of state to Birmingham, Atlanta, Indianapolis, and then just kept scaling my portfolio over the years. Um, my biggest asset was being frugal and saving money, putting away 80 to 100 grand every year for over a decade to get up to this point. Gotcha, gotcha. And you started, did you start out with single family rentals? Yeah, so like I didn't really start out with any net worth, but I had a decent paying job. So sure. bought that first rental and then took a couple of years to save up for the next one. And then, but after that, you know, I got into a pretty good cadence. And then, you know, in 2015, I had 11 of those rental properties and, then, you know, kind of learn what accredited investors earn you know, when your net worth gets above half a million is 
you know, re rental property is a great way to get started. And I still like suggest people get started with it if their net worth is lower, but man, what a pain. Um, and it's just not scalable. Um, with 11 rental properties, I had maybe an eviction or two every year, some kind of big catastrophe that happened every quarter, which is no problem because, you know, we always say use professional property management, but man, like, all that for like a few thousand dollars of passive cash flow that ain't enough for me or any american family so that's where the syndications and private placements came in gotcha now were you doing those single family rentals from a distance as well or were those close to where you were living at the time yeah at the time i was living in seattle washington so buying properties in birmingham atlanta indianapolis um, so they were remote so I had to use it leverage a team of professional property managers and, and brokers kind of do things from afar yeah yeah i i know what kind of strain that can put on because you were working on a full-time w2 at that time and i i know what kind of strain that puts on you know your your career and your life when you're trying to you know renovate these properties from two thousand miles away and you're dealing with kind of you know your bottom level contractors your bottom level property managers it's pretty difficult to to juggle all that stuff and and that may be why you kind of transitioned to you know the private equity space and syndications and started looking at that type of stuff yeah i mean i don't know I, I get why people do that whole burst strategy. I mean, it sounds good on paper, but it's just not what a credit investors do. I mean, I want to work with professionals, not Johnny with a tool toolbox truck flipping my properties from afar as I wire big sums of cash. I mean, I did construction engineering, construction management as my day job. I know what these contractors do. And it, to me, it's like, <laughs> it's just a disaster waiting to happen. Because, you know, these guys aren't your partners. That's the big difference between just right. burring properties. These these guys who are one paycheck away from stealing your money, um, they're, not, they're not incentivized to do what you want. You know, at some point, the relationship is just going to go sideways and you'll just lose your money. Yeah. Now, now what, how can you contrast and compare that, I guess, to uh, commercial syndication and, and, and I guess also go into how you kind of transitioned to that. I mean, how did you discover it? And then why did you make that transition from the single family stuff to the bigger syndications? Yeah. I mean, it's just scalability, right? Like with like the, the single family homes, I don't know why anybody does them, right? Like you have higher liability when you're doing it, you get your debt in your own name. Like, why not just invest with the pros that actually have way, way better deals, right? When you're buying single family homes, duplexes, triplexes, or quads, or anything under like 30 to 50 units, you're competing with unsophisticated mom and pop investors and you're overpaying all of the time, right? There's a nice little sweet spot between $5 million and $25 million. Um, these larger apartment complexes that are kind of underneath the institutional umbrella where there's a decent, there's a low level of competition picking up these 50 to 300 unit apartment complexes. And, you know, the, the deals are stronger in my opinion, partly because competition is less. But, you know, like, why do you go into big apartments? Well, economies of scale. I mean, I think everybody here is like, you want a property manager in the office at all times, which you can usually get at 60 units or greater, but Personally, I'd like to get above 100 so I can get that full-time dude to run around in the golf cart who can do plumbing repairs and HVAC repairs um, without paying third party and kind of le leverage that in-house staff person. So that's, to me, is the big, the big um, where you start to get the economies of scale. And that's, as an out-of-state investor, you're just getting abused by property managers because they know you're just some rich guy out in California, Seattle, Hawaii. And what, what are you going to do other than taking their buddies, you know, the, the, their buddy, their drinking buddy, that's a plumber or I'm not saying that this actually happens, but <laughs> property managers are lazy. They want to just go with the most reliable vendor. And most times it's, it may or not be the best value for you as the investor who's paying the bill. Right. Yeah, for sure. And sometimes they have their own properties and they're obviously going to try to put them in their properties before they put them in your properties. And they're just trying to do the absolute bare minimum. I mean, I remember having to 
uh, tell my property manager, hey, uh, my lease is up. And they didn't even let me know that it's up and there's nobody in there. And I had to post it on Craigslist and, and places like that myself and send them leads so they could put somebody in the property. And it's like, well, what am I paying you guys this 10% for? It, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, the, I mean, the residential property managers are like, their level of sophistication is nothing compared to a good commercial property manager. Right. Just night and day. And it's just kind of like a residential real estate agent. I mean, most real estate agents don't sell properties. They only sell like one a year. Whereas commercial real estate agents, I mean, for the most part, if they want to stay in the game, they have to be pretty legit and do their job. Um, so that's why we like to work in the commercial room realm because we get to work with um, professionals as opposed to kind of like the uh, the minor leagues in residential world and that just makes our job easier because when we we're willing to pay and, but we want professional um, service absolutely the, the level of service just goes up astronomically i mean they're running a real business they've got employees um, they have to depend on their reputation so they can't just, you know, screw you for a few thousand bucks here or there. Like they're trying to do the job and do the job right so that you're going to refer them to, to more commercial developers and, and owners and, and, you know, grow their business at the same time that you're growing yours. Right. And, and the thing I like going back to what you said, like alignment, like with mm -hmm. a lot of these property managers, you can kind of hold them accountable to KPIs, you know, which is more aligned to ultimately your bottom line. I mean, it is probably directly aligned with your bottom line, as opposed to when you're quarreling with your residential property manager, they're not quite aligned with you because they make more money when the property goes vacant with the lease up fees. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so I want to rewind a little bit. You know, when you were, you know, working full time at your W-2, we always talk about kind of that inflection point or when you've you know, had enough or you just were like, okay, I don't want to, just invest in my 401k and that's enough for me to retire on. You know, when did you have that aha moment when you started looking at alternative investments and, you know, even starting out with the single family stuff? I mean, when did you have that, that, you know, inflection point that, that you were like, okay, I've got to, I've got to look outside of the stock market and, and get into real estate. I mean, for me, it happened pretty early, like around 2010. I mean, when I was, when I did the math on how I was making money with my little dinky rental property with, tax benefits, mortgage pay down, appreciation and cash flow. Like I was making like 20 to 30% on my money. And I was like, I looked at my eight to 10% that I supposedly am supposed to get in the 401k that goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And I was like, the WTF, right? Like, and I started to realize, yeah, this is the way the system is engineered to kind of keep us all working in these like retail investments, mm -hmm. right? Retail investments are for the average guy. You never really want to be in the boat with the average guy. Um, unless you're too cheap to fly first class, but then, then you can sit back with the, the average guys. But as far as retirement goes, you don't want to be in that bus because you're going to get screwed over. Um, so that's where I kind of quickly realized like, yeah, this 401k thing isn't the best. I need to just put more and more of my, of my money into this, this uh, buying real assets like cash flow. But it took me like several years to finally pull the plug in my 401k because everything you're taught, your parents taught you, your friends, your family, your coworkers, people you think are supposedly good with money are telling you the complete opposite. So, Right. Yeah. I mean, I grew up the exact same way. I mean, that's, that's all I knew growing up was get the best job you could possibly get. No matter what, you know, for me, it was, I went to med school for a little bit. And I hated that. And I ended up transitioning to, to law school, but it was like th the same time. It was just like, what's the best job you can get? Be a doctor. What's the next best job you get in my mind? It was be a lawyer. I mean, it was just like, you know, it's ingrained in your head growing up. So it's really hard to get over that, that W2 save, you know, nine to five to your 65 mindset. Um, but once you're kind of freed of that, of those shackles, man, it, it just opens your mind up and opens your life up to, to kind of do the things and that you want to do and become the person that you were, you were meant to become. Right. I mean, ultimately it comes down to like, if you're happy or not, I mean, there's a lot of high income earners that, that they enjoy their job and therefore they will never really go down the road of alternative investing because they have no need to. And it's not me to say that they, in fact, I probably want to be more like them. They're happy. <laughs> They're yeah. happy clams, but 
I mean, I, for me, I didn't like my job at all. When I first started as a construction supervisor, you're stuck out there in the field managing these whiny babies that are like three times your age. And it's cold. I don't like being outside. A lot of engineers say, like, I like to be outside. I'm like, I'm like complete office. I want to be in the office where I can drink my tea and and wear a jacket. You know, like that's that's kind of more my style. Um, and I was like looking down the barrel 40, 50 year career with this stuff. I'm like, this sucks. Yeah. I don't want to do this. <laughs> so it was for me, it was kind of both those things. There was the pain point to move forward and there was a means i saw the path yeah yeah i, I love that man I, I saw the same thing at, at big law firm offices i just saw kind of the older partners and they're kind of the pinnacle of success right that's the person that you're supposed to want to become 30 years or 40 years down the line and it's like if that's what i'm aiming for i i don't want it i've got to figure out some other way to to, to be happy and to to be successful and this isn't the isn't the way to do it so yeah. um you know we each got to find our own pathways but like you said man lots lots of people are happy with their careers and that's fine but i always encourage them to still look at alternative investments because you know you, you should be able to at least have enough other income streams where you can step away from practice if you want to step away from your career, maybe go part time. Um, because at some point, you're probably not going to be happy with where you're at, you're going to want to spend more time with your family or travel or whatever it is. So you need to start preparing for that and investing for that now. You know, most people, they, even if they like their job, and they want to continue doing it, because they like working with their customers or their patients or whatnot. I think everybody's down to like work a little bit less, like maybe one or three days a week. <laughs> yeah. Um, eventually goes down to like one or none. But like, I think that's the thing. Like if you can alternatively invest, you're going to be able to retire, get to your freedom number, like in five to 10 years, especially if you make a professional six figure plus salary. So, I mean, it's a no brainer. I mean, to me, but a lot, yeah, that's a, that's the hard thing. If people don't have that means that nest, that scarcity element, they don't. There's no motivation to get off the beaten path and try something different and, and right. take risks. Yeah, yeah, agreed, man. A lot of times it, it takes. Um, unfortunately, sometimes it takes a, a an unfortunate event, something big that happens in their life. Somebody gets sick. Somebody dies. You know, something like that, and they're like, "Oh," and they have kind of have that epiphany moment. But hopefully, we can uh, speak to people before they, you know, something like that happens, and get them on the on the right track, right, Lane? Yeah, but that's not how humans are. <laughs> you know, we don't do anything until we get like a heart attack or something bad happens to us. Unfortunately, yeah, not many people cat- think proactively. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you need that catastrophic event to, to kick you in the butt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we need kicks in the butts for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me about the transition out, man. I mean, how were you able to, to walk away from your, your hot paying W2 and, and go full time into the real estate investing space? So I took a step down from my W2 job initially, like five years in. Um, I Working for a private company, it's more stressful. You get paid more. But I was like, this sucks. I didn't really like the people I worked for. And at the time, I was kind of making more money than them with my rental properties. So I kind of made the switch to go to more government jobs, which are pretty crews for those huge government workers out there. You guys know exactly what I'm talking about. So this allowed me a little bit more headspace and time on my hands to do what really mattered, which was real estate investing. So I did that for maybe about several more years until I finally kind of called it quits because, you know, kind of started to do bigger deals, started to, um, you know, the time it took to put together larger deals and doing what I was doing on the real estate investing side um, took way, way more, like 10 times more time than what I did at my day job. And especially because maybe it was because I worked for the public sector was, I didn't, I don't know, I kind of felt bad, right? It's kind of like you're stealing money from the government uh, in a way. And, And I didn't like the like the peer group where I was around. You know, you just, I try not to talk to coworkers too much. Not you know, just trying to do my own thing. <laughs> but you'll constantly hear all this like negativity and um, entitlement attitude from other coworkers. And like here I am on my laptop banging away, trying to do you know this entrepreneur stuff. And 
it was kind of a buzzkill. So for me, it was kind of, it was definitely time to leave. But I think it's hard, like for a lot of people that build up enough passive income to leave their day job, you at some point down the road, maybe working 10, 15 years, you start to develop, even five years, you start to develop like a, a identity surrounding your job, right? Like when you people introduce you, what are you like? I'm an engineer, I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor. And for good reason, because you've been training your whole life to be what you are, sometimes even 20 years plus. And it can be a bit of identity crisis to say, now I'm not anything. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you could say you're financially free, but you know, this people, a lot of people derive their value from the occupation they do, which it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a tough transition out, man. Like, uh, I, I literally within the last probably two months started saying when people, Hey, what do you do? Instead of leading with, I'm an attorney, I lead with, I'm a real estate investor. And it's, it's crazy to, to, to try to step away from that. And even still, I'll, I'll still say, well, I'm a real estate attorney by trade, but right now I, I invest more than anything else. And it's, uh, yeah. it's an interesting kind of thing, how you identify with, with that. And it, it's kind of a, a, a large piece of who you are and you've got to uh, figure out who you are at your core rather than identify who you are as a, as a worker. <laughs> yeah. I just lead with like hobbies and what I like to do. Cause I don't know. I feel still feel bad about calling myself a real estate investor. Cause like, you know, like put me in the category of like a house flipper or like a wholesaler. <laughs> It's like, uh, you know, <laughs> my parents still think I'm like a real estate agent. I don't know. They, yeah. <laughs> they don't understand. Parents, they don't understand ever. You know? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, so, so tell us about your current business. Um, what, what's that look like? You know, what, what does a real estate investor look like right now for you? Yeah, so, um, so I run the Hui Deal Pipeline Club. We bring in investors who want to invest passively with us. Um, we kind of target states more on the south and the southeast or southwest parts of the country. Um, I'm here in Hawaii. So Florida, the Carolinas are great markets, but they're just a little bit too far for me. Um, but a lot of our business is focusing on broker relationships because that's how we get the best deals. We were very active in 2020 and 2019. So now we're getting a lot of the top deal flow because we were the ones feeding business to the brokers when things were thin. Um, so the business plan is to pick up multifamily apartments that are in the workforce housing sector, so lower middle class. Rents between seven hundred dollars to twelve hundred dollars a month. Um, we look for things that are stabilized, existing cash flow in place. You know, none of these really huge fixer uppers, but definitely want to have some kind of business plan. We're rehabbing the units, new flooring, new appliances, new playground equipment, paint to bump the rents up maybe 15 percent across the board to get that NOI up. Um, but that's it's it's on the investment side. It's kind of rinse, wash, repeat. I mean, just run run deals through the analyzer see if it works and if it doesn't go on to the next one yeah yeah well, let's dive into your investing thesis a little bit more what um you know what kind of markets do you look at i mean you know i i feel like a lot of people are starting to move out of you know so-called primary markets into secondary tertiary markets um is that is that what you're seeing is that what you guys do or, or what are you looking for market-wise yeah i mean the criteria number one is like the, the damn thing's got cash flow Right. So it's mm -hmm. not going to be in a primary market. That's for sure. Even secondary yeah. markets are getting tougher today. Yeah. Um, next thing, it's got to be in a place where the population is increasing and there's the data for rent growth there. And we want to be in, in a, at least a tertiary market. So at least like half a million, probably greater population. Um, like, I, like Boise, Idaho is like you hear it's a great market, but it's just too damn small, in my opinion. Right. No inventory there. Yeah. I mean, it's so it's we're talking like the major markets like Phoenix, Houston, and then some more tertiary markets like a Huntsville or it's another good example. I mean, there's a bunch of tertiary markets out there. Uh, we've done stuff in Gulfport, Mississippi, and that's a great example of a smaller tertiary market. But I think as an investor, you're, you're kind of going a little bit of both and you need geographic diversification. 
Um, and then, you know, red states, not the same thing politically, but, you know, I, I prefer to be in places where the economy tends to be a little bit better, uh, better landmark friendly laws on the Indian landmarks. Yeah, yeah. And then you had mentioned, um, you know, working with working class, middle to lower class uh, tenant base, you know, so are you really only looking at kind of the, the lower B, B minus C plus type of type of assets? Yeah, I mean, originally when we started out, we were into the C-class assets because that's, you know, like just the size of the deal. We were able to only get the kind of the smaller deals. Um, it is a lot more pain in the butt to work with those types of tenants. Collections is very sure. difficult. You can make more money. But I think from this point on, the attitude that I have is like, there's a nice little sweet spot in the B class um, type of assets. You know, we, we want the collections to definitely be higher than 92% instead of dipping into the 80 percentile when we first take over. And, you know, that's pretty standard with class C. I think a lot of class C deals, they on paper look like they have a lot of cash flow, but that stuff is hit and miss for sure. Um, I just would rather you know, get more consistent returns. I mean, the returns are great. So, I mean, why, to me, why take more risk or more headaches on? Yeah. Yeah, definitely, man. Um, so when you're looking at, you know, well, I guess when you're looking at it from the passive investor standpoint, what are, what are some of the specific things that investors should look for whenever they get that, you know, that new offering memorandum that they get emailed and they go and watch the webinar? What are some of the things they need to look for before they uh, make the decision whether to invest or not. Yeah, I mean, 50% of it is the person, right? Um, but unfortunately, yeah. most passive investors don't know any other passive investors that have actually invested with a sponsor. To me, I mean, I mean, I wouldn't invest if, if I don't know anybody who's invested with a sponsor before. But it's taken me several years to kind of build up my network. And I think that's what you're going to have to do. So I think the best thing to do is mitigate into going into a sucker deal. Um, if you kind of just ask me like what the three biggest things to look out for is like, what is the reversion cap rate that the operator is using to ensure that they are underwriting it conservatively, assuming that they're selling it in a weaker market. Um, I usually like to see a half a point or a full point uh, increase in the reversion cap rate from the prevailing cap rate that's going in. Uh, secondly, I like to look at the rent increases per year because that's a real quick and dirty way of seeing, you know, what are they using for escalators? Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to see the rents going up three, four percent or more every single year because that's not going to happen. I don't care if the pace of inflation is supposedly two and a half, three percent. It ain't going to happen. And it greatly skews the numbers. And I think what passive investors don't realize is, yeah, sure, it can be a hundred percent return in five years, but you know, I can fudge whatever number on this side to get whatever number you want to see. So it's important for a passive investor to understand what are the numbers on the spreadsheet that you can fudge and to what assumptions are using on those cells that ultimately greatly impact their total return on investment. And, you know, but just by changing the reversion cap rate by a half percent, that can swing, that can turn a 100% return five-year deal down to a 60% return in five-year deal, greatly impacting your returns. But more importantly, I mean, the analogy I like to use is like, all these deals are like kind of like airplanes. They, they, they close, everybody claps their hands. Yay, yay, congratulations. And then the plane takes off over to the mountains and nobody ever hears about it again. <laughs> right. So as a passive investor, you want to at least go around and check is, you know, what are assumptions we'll be using in this deal to ensure that, you know, I don't know about the pilot at this point that may be uncertain from the passive investor's point of view. They have to kind of do these test investments and try to kind of do things um, and, and test it out, see if the operator is legit, see if they do what they're going to say they're going to do. Um, but you can at least go around and check the gas tanks on these planes and make sure you don't hop into a plane with a quarter tank of gas as it takes off across the, the abyss. So that's kind of my, my thought process on like folks that you know, are kind of getting started. You're gonna to have to take that leap of faith for sure. Um, you're not gonna have the network to be able to figure out who to invest with yet. 
but that should be obviously a big um, goal. But there are things to check for in terms of underwriting that are, you don't need to be an underwriting specialist, but there are things to ch definitely check to make sure you don't go into a sucker deal. Yeah. Yeah. It all comes down to those assumptions, man. I mean, what assumptions are the sponsors making in their underwriting to hit those projections? I mean, if those projections, if they say, Hey, I'm going to double your money in five years, which a lot of people say, I mean, ask them how, like, what, what are these, as you said, especially the reversion cap rate and the rent increases per year. Those are two really big ones that you can just, you know, change in your little Excel spreadsheet, pump it out and bam, you've got these crazy returns. And you know that really the business plan is not going to be able to be executed to meet those meet those goals. Yeah, I mean another couple that kind of just come to mind is like I don't want to see a huge bump on rents. Like if I see it being bumped up more than twenty percent, I I just kind of scratch my head. That's like you know like perhaps you found a diamond in a rough where the rents are severely under market. But you know if you're looking at a hundred fifty unit or greater. I, don't, I, I really, I don't know. I don't believe in the Easter bunny personally, and I don't believe in miracles, but it's, well, all right. Well, maybe you did, maybe it is legitimately like 20% under market rents, but then I better see your, your economic occupancy drop your first year or two as people give you the middle finger as you bump the rents up two, 300 bucks on them <laughs> in the first month. Um, you know, it's like uh, things like that are the ones that really drive the model. Whereas like, what's another one? Um, passive investors are like, you know, like I see you use 3.75 as your, your, invest, your interest rate. You know, what if it's a 3.5? You know, if anybody's ever played around with the model, the interest rate doesn't really have a huge impact on total returns at the end of the day. Of course, you want to be in a deal where they're trying to be conservative and Kind of erroring on a quarter point higher than what they think it should be um just so that there's extra buffer but you know as a that just doesn't it it's kind of small potatoes you know it's not the driving kpis yeah yeah and and like you said those big rent bumps it's like okay well if i can just buy the property and bump up the rent 200 or 250 dollars a month with doing you know minimal renovations it's like well why didn't the current owners just do that then um, if, if there's that much meat on the bone without a lot of work, it's probably too good to be true. Yeah. I think you just got to like, look at a lot of deals. Cause then you start to be like, Oh my right. God, I've heard this story before our seller is retiring. And you know, it's always some kind of story. Like at, at the end of the day, I think, I mean, past investors could go to the trouble of doing their own rent comps, but it's hard because you don't have access to Coast Scar or all these programs. Right. Your, you could go look for a similar property, a similar size, a similar year within a few mile radius. But unless you go walk into that building and you check out units, and you check out the subject property units, you could be $200 off. It could just be totally different. You definitely can't go by pictures. Yeah, yeah. All right, man, let's switch gears a little bit because I saw this in uh, on another podcast you did. Uh, tell us about the thing you call Emergency Fund 2.0. What, what is that and how can it be beneficial for our, our listeners? Yeah, so a lot of, um, you know, I think most of the financial advice geared towards like broke guys and we're in credit card debt. Um, people are listening to this podcast. I should hope you guys are the ones, you know, maxing out your 401ks, being diligent savers. So I don't think you guys should, like a lot of the financial advice doesn't really pertain to folks like ourselves. Um, but yet, you know, we, a lot of people still follow this, like, oh, I need an emergency savings account, like six months, right? Where I'm like, well, I want an opportunity fund in case these syndication deals come up and I can like launch 50 grand at it and then launch another 50 grand at another one. And oh, this deal, this, this deal is like, running away from these guys I want to put into that one too. So to kind of flip the script a little bit, turn it from an emergency fund to an opportunity fund. One of the ways I do that is, um, and this kind of goes to the question, like what do I do with my short-term liquidity as I'm waiting around for one of these longer term equity deals to come up? Well, I like to use, you know, things like um, private note funds where you can uh, get your liquidity out um, infinite banking is a big go-to for a lot of people that are net worth a million dollars or greater. 
sure you got to pay the fees to the insurance agent that you know obviously you got to take that into account because those insurance salesmen are always you know they don't really kind of showcase it the right way the whole there is a cost to this stuff right but that's i mean i use it but in moderation and i kind of know how to how much to use in my situation to have enough uh, money on hand in case a good deal does come by i love that man an opportunity fund so if a big opportunity comes up you're not completely dry on your liquidity you can figure out a way to invest it in something where it's not just sitting there you're still making a little bit of a return on your money but it's liquid so that you can invest in those those big opportunities whenever they arise right right but you know for most passive investors i mean there's not really like any steal of a deal coming through they're all kind of normalized for the most part i mean like if the deal is better, the general partner is probably going to take more of a heavier split. And that's, it's fair. It's fair for them, right? You as a passive investor, you're kind of buying a commodity investment. But the, the key is it's way, way better than anything you'll find on Wall Street or the retail for the masses. Yeah. So I know you focus a lot uh, on educating people and creating content for people that are interested in getting started in, in these passive syndications. And what are some of your best tips to, to get started? Cause a lot of my listeners, you know, they, they haven't invested in one of these things yet. They're just looking to get started and, you know, wiring that $50,000 to somebody that maybe you just heard on a podcast or you watch them on a webinar and you, and you want to get started. I mean, how do they get over that? How do they get over that hump? Just do it, man. Suck it up and do it. <laughs> I mean, what, I tell them like, look, we know what's going to happen. If you keep doing what you're going to do, just go look over to the older guy in the office and you'll be exactly like that sucker. Do you want that to ha happen? Maybe you do. I mean, that's fine. Right. But if you want something different, you're going to have to do something different. Um, and that's, so, but ultimately, especially if you have never owned rental properties before, you're kind of diving in the dark here. Um, you don't have a network. You don't know who to trust. Uh, what I would suggest is you have to hurry up and do some test investments quick. Um, I've had people in my mastermind invest a million dollars in nine months. I don't necessarily uh, recommend that for most people. I think that's a little quick, but you you may have to invest a you know fifty grand, fifty grand, fifty grand in a few deals and sit and then wait for like six to eighteen months to see if your operator is legit to deploy more capital. Um, so it's kind of a hurry up, pause, and then deploy even more um, because this stuff, I mean, that's another thing. Like some investors are like, I, I invested $150,000. When am I going to reach financial freedom? I'm like, dude, you only invested like 5% of your net worth. That ain't, that ain't going <laughs> to cut it. You know, like the problem is 95% of your money is not doing anything, right? Stock market, 401k, but you want to be prudent about this stuff, right? That's what's hard about syndication and private placements. A lot of it is private and you don't know who to trust. And this is where it all kind of points to building a relationship with other pure passive investors to figure out who to work with and more importantly, who to stay away from. But in terms of like the big flow chart, like I've kind of discovered all these secrets that the wealthy do and they're not that hard. But unless you go into syndicated deals and get passive activity losses, use passive activity losses to lower your W-2 ordinary income or just simply offset your passive income, you don't get more money to put into infant banking, to get into all these tax and legal strategies that the wealthy do. So it, the syndication stuff is like, it's a small part of the larger picture. It, I would say it's like a third of the picture that people are missing out on. But unless you go through the syndication stuff, that's the critical path to getting to the rest of the good stuff. So hurry yeah. up. <laughs> yeah. Agreed, man. I mean, you've got to, you know, educate yourself to a certain extent. And when you feel a, a certain level of comfort, man, you've just got to pull the trigger and do it. And then you're going to learn from there. You're going to learn from that first investment. You're going to start networking with, with similar people, other passive investors, meet other sponsors and your, you know, your world's just going to expand and it's going to go from there. But at some point you've got to pull the trigger and it's got to be sooner rather than later. Right. Like if, if I plop somebody at a table with five accredited investors and they haven't done anything, it's going to be very hard for them to build organic relationships with them. So sometimes, I mean, even in the worst case scenario, you invest 50 grand with the absolute shyster, which I did back in 2013. So I lost my money. But the best thing is I, I got a great story to tell. And now I can use that to parlay <laughs> into building relationships with other investors. 
a, a 50k uh, a 50k story there man it's pretty expensive <laughs> yeah well so is college right <laughs> right there you go <laughs> all right man well let's jump into the freedom four it's time for the freedom four what's the best thing you do to keep your mind and body healthy um i, I always work out try and um eat right and get eight hours of sleep try to every night um if you don't have your your health uh you got nothing yeah well yeah what's the point man if, if you don't have your health what's the point of having wealth um what's one life hack or or even a piece of technology you use to be your most productive self um i think i just like figure out what the next thing is and just get, get it and execute it get it done i mean a lot of people their problem is like they they have all these grand master plans but they never figure out what is the next thing to kind of move that forward in a small incremental form um i think success is a bunch of binary yeses and noes strung together in the right order. Um, every decision you make is either a yes or no, and some are kind of more important than the others. But um, you know, people don't get to where they're at just by chance. It's kind of like a pachinko machine going through the thing, and it's always goes from one direction to the other. Um, so be very conscious about what are the yeses and no you're, you're, you're making today and week to week. Love it. Love it. What's one actionable step our listeners can do right now to start creating more freedom? They can invest money. And um, yeah, I think most people stick too much to podcasts and books. You know, the 70, 20, 10 formula says that 10% is just the academic stuff. That's podcast books. 20% is people finding other peers who've done this before, learning from them. That's kind of hard in post-pandemic uh, world and we're all distant. But um, 70% is just doing it, man. I mean, you don't learn until you do it. You know, it's like, Absolutely. I'm going to kind of play around with crypto a little bit. What am I going to do? I'm just going to throw some money in the game and learn. It's not, I'm, I don't, I'm not interested. I don't, even learn. I don't care. Yeah, absolutely. Almost like betting on a, on a sports game. You're like, I'm gonna put a little bit of money on that. So it actually matters to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, or, you know, just simply doing it right. And so just yeah. thinking there. All right. Last but not least, how has passive income made your life better? Uh, game, total game changer. I mean, if, if not, I'd still be working my engineering job. I, I didn't like, um, I can buy a lot more toys even though I, that's not everything, but you know, life's money doesn't make money is a, like a multiplier. It, it kind of multiplies who you are as a person. Um, money's not everything, but it sure makes a life a lot easier. There we go. There we go. All right, Lane, I appreciate you coming on today, man. Where can our listeners find out more about you? Um, they can check out my podcast, simple passive cash flow investing. Um, kind of started talking a lot about single family home rentals. But as I became more of an accredited investor, it's kind of been a follow my journey, uh, talking about a lot of this tax legal uh, investing ideas. And uh, my email address is lane at schoolpassivecashflow.com. All right, brother. Thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. All right. Thanks for sharing your journey, Lane. Love the insight into transitioning out of a high paying W-2 and what to look for when making that very first investment. Major key, I'm not telling you to quit your day job. I'm asking you to create options for yourself. I'm asking you to say yes to freedom, yes to security, and yes to living. Creating income streams outside of your nine to five through real estate, franchises, e-commerce, what have you, that will get you there. Layer on tools like infinite banking and self-directed retirement accounts will supercharge that journey. All right. Let's start building some alternative passive income streams together. Go to PassiveIncomeAttorney.com and join our Esquire Passive Investor Club to join my circle. Until next time, folks, enjoy the journey. Thank you for listening to the Passive Income Attorney Podcast with Seth Bradley. Do you want more ideas on how to generate multiple streams of passive income? Then jump over to PassiveIncomeAttorney.com for show notes and resources. Then apply for the private Facebook community 
by searching for The Passive Income Attorney on Facebook. And we'll see you on the next episode.